In just a moment, biographies and sound, but first, you've seen Jimmy Stewart in a variety of movies from the Western to the mystery story, from the romantic to the comic. But now, NBC's Weekday will feature soft-spoken Jimmy in a new type of role, that of friend and companion to millions of radio listeners. Yes, your favorite daytime radio service, Weekday, brings some of the world's most exciting personalities right into your home. And in addition to Jimmy Stewart, tomorrow's program also includes an interview with Dr. Eugene Austin, president of Colby Junior College, and a whole day filled with the best fun and factual features. Now stay tuned for Biographies and Sound on NBC. In answer to many requests, and because of the unusual interest shown in the Biography and Sound broadcast of last November 1st, the National Broadcasting Company presents a repeat broadcast of They Knew Thomas Wolfe. This is Biography in Sound. I think he wanted fame, but I don't think he wanted particularly this great popularity. He just wanted people to like him because he liked people. He was too huge for the world, in a sense, so he had to be compressed. He was a man who tried to embrace the whole of life and succeeded almost better than one would have believed possible. He could see beauty in everything and make poetry out of everything. We all get excited, and we all feel things, but Tom felt them about ten times as much. And he had a burning sincerity. The National Broadcasting Company presents... They knew Thomas Wolfe, a biography in sound of the enormously gifted American writer who died in 1938, and whose unique contribution to American literature includes such books as Look Homeward, Angel, Of Time and the River, The Web and the Rock, and You Can't Go Home Again. Your narrator is Gene Hamilton, and to tell you about Thomas Wolfe as they knew him will be his sister, his editor's and his friends. Dramatic readings will be by Ken Nordine. I am Mabel Wolf Wheaton, sister of Thomas Wolf. I want to tell you a little of Tom's birth into our family and a little of our background and a few of the memories of him as a child. Tom was born in the family October the 3rd, 1900. We were born at 92 Woodman Street. Asheville, North Carolina. We were born in the same room, a family of eight. We were born in the same room on the same bed, I believe. People didn't throw their furniture away those days, you know, and so the house was set there for years, about as it started. Tom was a very good baby. He came along six years after Fred and uh, was a child of our parents' old age, and they expected great things out of him. Tom was um, 12 years old when he entered the North State School. He'd been in the public schools, and the last year of his uh, going to the public schools, I think it was the seventh grade, a man by the name of J.M. Roberts was the principal of the school. Mrs. Roberts, Tom's old teacher, who has been known as his beloved Margaret uh, in, all, in, in his books and everything, Margaret Roberts, didn't know Tom when he was in the public school. But Mr. Roberts um, put out, read a little story, a little French story, and he asked the, the grades, the three grades, I think it was the sixth, seventh, and eighth, to write a little essay on what they remembered of his reading. He read them the story, and he wanted their interpretation or their review of the thing, and they all uh, wrote. Up to that time, I don't think he'd paid any special attention to Tom Wolfe, except that he got good grades. He took these little compositions home, and Mrs. Roberts was to look them over in her spare time. She wasn't teaching. And she said to Mr. Roberts a few days later, she said, who is this, uh, who is this uh, Tom Wolfe? And he said, well, he lives over here on Woodford Street. His father's in the tombstone business down on the square, in the monument business. She said, well, there's your best essay of them all. Tom had wanted to go to the University of Virginia. 
But uh, our father wanted to make a lawyer of him. But Tom had other ideas. No one knew that he intended to be a writer. We thought a lawyer with his big voice and he, his command of English, and uh, he was a, a great speaker. He could get up at any moment in school and, and seemed to have possession of his, of his faculties and could think on his feet. And, of course, our father kept saying to us, don't you laugh. Tom, you know, was just sun, moon, and stars to them when he was a child. And he said, don't you laugh at it. He'll be governor of the state someday. He'll go to the United States Senate. When Thomas Wolfe, a few months short of his 16th birthday, came down from the mountains surrounding Asheville to the rolling country of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, he began an undergraduate career full of excitement, companionship, and honors. It was here he met Professor Frederick H. Koch and decided he wanted to be a playwright. His classmates recall that he was genial, generous, a friend to all, and full of schoolboyish high spirits. By every standard, he was a success as a college student. And he graduated in 1920 from the university, and it had been pretty well decided by him and his teachers there that he was to go to Harvard to the 47 workshop, which was then being taught by George Pierce Baker. Dr. Baker and Tom became great friends at Harvard. And Dr. Baker believed in him. Tom was most enthusiastic in playwriting. He dreamed and he wrote home that he'd get a play on Broadway and something that would live. And we of the family couldn't see much to that. We didn't, we, we thought it took a genius or someone with great talent. We couldn't see anything in our family, our background, anything that deserved the name genius. And we couldn't feel, he was too close to us. And we thought these writers and playwriters, you know, all ones like Tennyson and Poe and all of them, they were so removed, they were on pedestals above us. We, we spoke of them uh, as far away, and we couldn't feel that someone so close to us had uh, the power to write a play or to write a book. And no one had thought of his being a novelist at the time that he was at, at the time he was at Harvard. But Dr. Baker wrote home and asked Mama to produce the money one more year, that he would be greater than O'Neill if they just gave him time. And then it was, I think, the last year. He wrote several plays there, but I think there were 17 short plays in all, I think, are housed at Harvard uh, in the Houghton Library. I believe I'm right in that figure. Manor House is one of them, but Welcome to Our City was given at Harvard uh, the last year Tom was there. Tom came down to New York and submitted his play, Welcome to Our City, to the Theater Guild, and they kept it and kept it, and he hung around New York, and he wrote home. It was very hopeful because it had been so welcomed and so successful at, at um, Radcliffe up at Boston. Why, he thought surely that this Theater Guild would take it immediately. But one evening he went, and the man who had the manuscript or who had the play shut down his desk, handed it to him, told him he couldn't use it. And Tom almost burst into tears. And he told him what the public wanted, that the public wanted realism. They didn't want just this beauty and this fantastic writing. They wanted realism. Now, whether that had anything to do with his writing the Comrade Angel from his life, story from the weather of his life, I don't know. Before leaving Harvard, Wolf had applied to Professor Homer Andrew Watt chairman of the Department of English of Washington Square College of New York University for a position as an instructor. Wolf received the appointment, and at New York University, he sustained himself as a teacher from 1924 until 1930. Theodore Ersom, himself a professor at New York University today, was one of the students Thomas Wolf taught. Well, it's a long time ago, but I was at the Washington Square College in 1929, and one of the courses that was required for a freshman was a survey course in English and American literature. And the text for the course was a huge one. Most freshmen were a little bit apprehensive as to whether we would read everything in it. And on, of course, it turned out we didn't. Our first day in class, this huge six-foot-six gentleman came in and introduced himself as Thomas Wolfe. And then he uh, took us from the very beginning, Beowulf, all the way down to and through Thomas Hardy, through most of this huge book. 
But uh, his uh, whole claim uh, on us was, was the intensity with which he taught. I mean, his, uh, his whole life seemed in that hour to be focused on nothing else except teaching us. He was very interested in the poetry. And uh, we were enraptured. I mean, we realized it as if there were a big sign across the front, genius at work. We knew in our crude way that nothing you could do would stop him from teaching you at that particular time. You were seeing something you knew that was, well, like a volcano erupting. It was one in a hundred. We didn't know what to do about it except to be glad it was happening, I suppose, to be in awe of it and not to interrupt. You see, he held his classes in, 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 uh, in good order and good discipline by the the fury of his enthusiasm, shall we say. All the while that Wolf was teaching, in his spare moments, he was engulfed in a tremendous labor. It had all grown out of his endeavor to set down the shape and feel of one year in childhood. From that beginning, he had conceived the plan for a book in which he wanted to present the picture not merely of his youth, but of the whole town from which he came and all the people in it, just as he had known them. And as he labored on it, the thing took life beneath his hand and grew. And already he could dimly see the substance of a dozen other books to carry the thread, moving out as he had moved from that small town into the greater world beyond. Until in the end, as the strands increased, extended, wove, and crossed, they would take on the denseness and complexity of the whole web of life and of America. I remember very well the day when the manuscript of Tom's first book came in, uh, the book that was later published under the title Look Homeward Angel. That was not the title that the manuscript bore when it came in. Mr. John Hall Wheelock. Tom had uh, various titles in mind, and the one that he had finally settled on at that time was O Lost. But uh, we at Scribner's felt that that was not a very attractive title or particularly descriptive of the book, and we got Tom to change it to Look Homeward Angel, which, as you know, is taken from uh, Lycidas, the line from Milton's Lycidas, uh, Look Homeward Angel now and melt with Ruth. Well, Tom had been working for a number of years on this enormous uh, manuscript. In fact, all Tom's books were part of one great uh, conglomeration of manuscript. And uh, he was teaching during the years when he was working on this book at New York University. In the summers, he went abroad, traveled in England and uh, on the continent, and was working all the time on this book. And the time came in uh, 1928 when he felt that he had done all that he could with it, and he sent it out to, I don't remember the exact number of publishers, but I should think perhaps seven or eight. And uh, they all declined the uh, book. Then Tom gave up hope of getting it published, but as a last... Uh, attempt, he turned it over to an agent, Madeleine Boyd, and went abroad. We got the manuscript, received the manuscript sometime in, uh, I think it was August, 1928, and it was first read by Mr. Dunn, Mr. Charles Dunn of Scribner's, who um, reads many manuscripts there and has for many years one of our ablest men. And he was very much impressed by it. It was an enormous, unpromising-looking manuscript, uh, quite battered and worn, showing the, uh, uh, its career. It had been to various publishers and thumbed over and read and declined. But he got very much excited. Mr. Dunn got very much excited reading passages from this book, and he turned it over to me. Uh, I was at that time in 1928 an assistant editor to Maxwell Perkins, who was the managing editor of Scribner's. And I read it, and I was equally excited. And I read the whole thing and drew up a report on it for Mr. Scribner and for Mr. Perkins. 
And then Mr. Perkins himself read it, and as a result of that, wrote a letter to Thomas Wolfe. It's very brief and reads as follows. Mrs. Ernest Boyd left with us some weeks ago the manuscript of your novel, O Lost. I do not know whether it would be possible to work out a plan by which it might be worked into a form publishable by us, but I do know that setting the practical aspects of the matter aside, it is a very remarkable thing and that no editor could read it without being excited by it and filled with admiration by many passages in it and sections of it. Your letter that came with it shows that you realize what difficulties it presents, so that I need not enlarge upon this side of the question. What we should like to know is whether you will be in New York in a fairly near future when we can see you and discuss the manuscript. We should certainly look forward to such an interview with very great interest. Tom said that when he got this letter, he felt like a man who jumped on the horse and rode in all directions. He was elated. He was delighted to know there was someone who was interested, who would even read the manuscript. He came back to America as soon as he could, and the next day went into Scribner's. He walked back and forth. That's 597 Fifth Avenue in New York City. He walked back and forth for a long time before he got the courage to go in, and he went upstairs. And when he emerged from the place uh, a couple of hours later, he was crunching something in his hand, but he was so delighted that he found himself way up at 124th up at Morningside Park or someplace up there, and he never knew how he got there, he said. And in his hand, he was still clutching this thing, and he opened it with a check of $500 that Scribner had given him, the first money he'd re ever received. He came home, though, in September, and I remember he, we had a big uh, gathering at my home, a party, and I had invited all the people in town I knew who were literary or who were teachers or who could appreciate Tom, and he seemed pleased with the party, and the next afternoon, we carried him to the station with Mama, and, of course, our father was dead, and we had Mama in the car and Tom, and Tom walked me down the tracks at Biltmore, and he said to me, now, Mabel, I want to tell you something. He said, when I come again, I'll probably have to come incognito. He said, be wearing whiskers or the like. And he saw that I was a little dumbfounded. And he said, you know, he said, I've written in this book uh, a few things about people that I'm afraid some of them are not going to like. The thought that he might hurt people by revealing them as he had seen them pained Wolf. But his aim was to write an epic. And he could write it no differently than he saw it. In a lengthy letter accompanying the manuscript to the publisher, he wrote, To me, who was joined so passionately with the people in this book, it seemed that they were the greatest people I had ever known, and the texture of their lives the richest and strangest, and discounting the distortion of judgment that my nearness to them would cause, I think they would seem extraordinary to anyone. If I could get my magnificent people on paper as they were, if I could get down something of their strangeness and richness in my book, I believe that no one would object to my 250,000 words, or that if my pages swarmed with this rich life, few would damn in inept manner and accuse me of not knowing the technique for making a book, as practiced by Balzac, Flaubert, Hardy, or Gide. If I have failed to get any of this opulence into my book, the fault lies not in my people who could make an epic but in me. On Sunday, October 20th, 1929, the first reviews of Look Homeward Angel were published in Wolfe's hometown. The next day, just about everybody in town went out to buy the book, and they read it, and then the storm broke. I was secretary of the largest club in town, the Woman's Club, recording secretary. So on this Tuesday afternoon, I went to our Woman's Club and I, the whole place was buzzing. But when I got up to the door of the room, they were standing around in groups. And if you had ever, uh, I've heard about the locusts coming and the great noise they make and coming to our district. But there they were all buzzing. And as soon as they saw me, everything stopped. You could have heard a pin drop. I went in the room and um, my subconscious mind seemed to work at the same time I was carrying on. I knew they hated me. I went up to the desk and had to start the meeting. I read their names, and uh, then I read some letters that were received, and I read the minutes of the last meeting, 
And uh, then we had a speaker that afternoon, a Judge Hyatt, and he made the speech. But during the time of his speech, I hardly know what he said. I began to look the faces over in front of me, and then it was that I knew how they disliked even the sound of our voice or anything, and I knew that Tom had disturbed them in his book. Uh, we hadn't heard any compliments. Everyone was just completely shocked. My mother and I began getting telephone calls. All day long, the, the uh, phone would ring, and most of it was sympathy for us, sympathy that we had Tom Wolfe. And finally, um, after about two weeks, I went to town one day, and one of my old friends from a large family here, an important family, she shook her fist right up in my face, and she said, we know what to do with people like Tom Wolfe when he comes back. I rushed right home and wrote him a letter. I knew no one in the family had written it. I knew that the shock of the town, the talk in the town, and I said, Dear Tom, uh, you certainly have put us on the map. We aren't nonentities anymore. And that would certainly please Papa if he could look down and, and uh, hear and see a little that's going on. We, the whole world seems to be Gant or Wolf conscious. And I said, Now, don't you worry at all about what you've done. You're a writer now. Thomas Wolfe had indeed become a writer. Two of his friends at this time were Clayton and Kathleen Hoagland. Mrs. Hoagland, herself a novelist, recalls... He used to visit us in Rutherford quite often. One night, it was in August, a beautiful moonlight night, and another friend was with him. Around about one o'clock in the morning, we decided we would walk down to the station with him. He had just had about 15 cups of tea, which he loved, and uh, 10 or 11 fish sandwiches, cold fish sandwiches, another of his pet things. But anyway, we started out. We got down towards the station, which is the Carlton Hill station at Rutherford. And uh, it is also the little station where the bleachery has its loading platform and works, and they're built of yellow brick. I'm describing this because I wanted to see what happened to me. So Tom was coming along with his head thrown back, and his hair, you know, curls were just, he'd thrown back, and walking as if he owned the world and sniffing up everything. So we got down where it wasn't built up very much, and there in front of us was this little station, a little wooden shack, one room. Behind it, silhouetted in the moonlight, was this great big tree, and the rails were like silver ribbons, and the insects were going up and down. You know how they go in that chorus? And there was a freight car, two freight cars, one red, I remember, and one brown. Uh, one was a Virginia Railroad. And Tom looked, and he, you'd think he was sniffing fire like a Dalmatian or something when he saw a freight car because he got all excited. And his eyes came to light. Everything came to light, and he threw his arms out. And he looked at me, and he said, Kitty, Kitty, you know, he always spoke with a kind of a stutter when he got excited and, and wrapped in something. He, Kitty, look, this is America. All over the country, there are little stations like this with a tree. There's a siding with a factory loading or loading. Freight cars. Look at the rails. Here, he said, come. And he made us kneel down and feel the vibrations on the tracks of a train that might be coming. Then he said, come along. I want to show you how you should write. See these walls. Feel them. You can't write except you feel them. Look at the color. They are yellow. They are a faded yellow. He said, feel those. We all had to feel the walls. He said, feel the ground. Put your hand on the ground. He said, listen to the insects. Look, this moon is shining over all of this eastern part of America. It will be shining. He said, this is America, Kitty. Well, I came home, and I sat down, and I thought, well, now I know why he writes like he does. He's in love with America. America has a thousand lights and weathers, and we walk the streets. We walk the streets forever. We walk the streets of life alone. It is the place of the howling winds, the hurrying leaves in old October, the hard, clean falling to the earth of acorns, 
The place of the storm-tossed moaning of the wintry mountainside, where the young men cry out in their throats and feel the savage vigor, the rude, strong energies. The place also where the trains cross rivers. It is a fabulous country. The only fabulous country. It is the place where miracles not only happen, but where they happen all the time. It is the place of autumnal moons hung low and orange at the frosty edges of the pines. It is the place of frost and silence, of the clean, dry shocks and opulence of enormous pumpkins that yellow on hard clotted earth. It is the place of the stir and feathery stumble of the hens upon their roosts, the frosty, broken barking of the dogs, the great barn shapes and solid shadows in the running sweep of the moon-whited countryside, the wailing whistle of the fast express. It is the place of flares and steamings on the tracks and the swing and bob and tottering dance of lanterns in the yards, it is the place of dings and knellings and the sudden glare of mighty engines over sleeping faces in the night. It is the place of the terrific web and spread and smoldering, the distant glare of Philadelphia and the solid rumble of the sleepers. It is also the place where the Transcontinental Limited is stroking 80 miles an hour across the continent and the small, dark towns whip by like bullets. And it is only the fan-like stroke of the secret, immense, and lonely earth again. listening to Biography in Sound, which is presenting tonight a portrait of Thomas Wolfe. Biography in Sound will continue after a 10-second pause for station identification. Biography in Sound, Part 2. After Wolfe left his first publisher he chose for his new editor, Edward Aswell, then associated with Harper and Brothers, and who performed the tremendous task of editing The Web and the Rock, You Can't Go Home Again, and The Hills Beyond. Mr. Aswell. Today, after 26 years, while most of the books of the period are dead and forgotten, Look Homeward Angel is still being reprinted and its total sales have far exceeded those of most bestsellers. Each new generation, as it comes along, rediscovers it and claims this book for its own. For Wolf wrote about youth, and he spoke to youth more convincingly than any American writer has ever done. Thousands, reading him for the first time, have found something of themselves suddenly become articulate and universal, and with the joy of recognition have murmured, Ah, yes, that's the way it is. After the publication of Look Homeward Angel, Wolfe threw the great force of his genius into his writing. He was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship and traveled in Europe. During this period, America was shunned by many of our young writers, and some of them even found pleasure in debunking things American. Thomas Wolfe never joined that chorus. And in Europe, he was homesick and haunted by the memories of his homeland. He made his headquarters in New York, writing, teaching, and often thinking of Asheville, which he had not visited in seven years. He had come to the city with a shout of triumph and of victory in his blood, and the belief that he would conquer it, be taller and more mighty than its greatest towers. But now he knew a loneliness unutterable. In the blind lashings of his fury, he strove with all the sinews of his heart and spirit, trying to master, to devour, and utterly to possess the great, the million-footed, the invincible and unceasing city. 
He almost went mad with loneliness among its million faces. Why was he so unhappy? Suddenly, he remembered the streets of noon some dozen years ago. And the solid, lonely, liquid leather shuffle of men's feet as they came home at noon to dinner. The welcoming shout of their children. The humid warmth and fragrance of the turnip greens. The sound of screen doors being slammed. And then the brooding hush and peace and full-fed apathy of noon again. And after seven years' absence, Thomas Wolfe went home again. He came to visit Mama and to hunt a cabin to write in, to be near Asheville, but to be alone. And uh, you never saw such a welcoming as Asheville gave him. They stood in groups around him on the street, and uh, 12 to 20 would be around him, talking to him, and they'd come and they, someone yelled one day and said, they're not wanting to kill you now, Tom, because you put them in the book, but there are a number of them around here who would because you didn't put them in. And uh, he was received, steak dinners were given for him, and he was asked by the clubs and by the hotels and that to speak here and there. The headlines were in the paper that Tom Wolfe was home, and uh, we were all very happy. We were happy to know that the people were receiving him, and he was delighted to know that, uh, that there was no hatred in their hearts and that they wanted him home and he wanted to come home. Wolfe returned to New York. But in the summer of 1937, he went back to Asheville to spend the summer riding and relaxing on a wooded hilltop near the city recreation park. In the fall, he went again to New York and severed connections with his longtime friend and editor, Maxwell Perkins. In a letter to his mother, Wolf wrote of his new editor, Edward Aswell, saying, I have been invited out to the country by one of my new editors for Christmas. He is a young man just my own age, married, and with a child just a year old. I think he is a very fine fellow, and I believe I'm going to have a good time. Well, Thomas Wolfe spent a good many nights, weekends at my house in the country in Chappaqua, New York, and he spent the last Christmas of his life with me there, and I'll never forget the occasion. We had made plans to meet in the um, early afternoon of Christmas Eve, the lower level of Grand Central Station. And knowing how Tom felt about trains, he wrote about them at great length. Knowing how he felt about them, I also knew that he couldn't catch them. So it was arranged that if by any chance he should not be there, I would take the train, and then he would be on the next one, which I would meet in Chappaqua. Well, I arrived well ahead of time in the early afternoon of that Christmas Eve, and Grand Central Station was what it's always like on Christmas Eve. It was just a milling mass of humanity. But I had no trouble at all discovering that Thomas Wolfe was not there because he stood head and shoulders above anybody else in the crowd. And I pushed my way to the gate, and he still was not anywhere in sight, and I waited until almost train time. It then occurred to me, well, perhaps he arrived early and got aboard the train. So I rushed down and walked through the train to look for him. And he was not there. I came out at the last coach and spoke to the conductor, briefly described Thomas Wolfe and asked whether he had seen the man. He said, oh, you mean that fellow who always gets off at Chappaqua? Well, I was a little impressed because he clearly recognized him and knew where he went. And he said, well, yes, we all know him on this line. He knows all of us, too. He knows our wives' names and how many children we've got and how much illness we've had in the family, and he always asks us about the various members of the family. But no, he's not on this train. So, as arranged, I took the train and went home with no Tom. Having arrived home, I then motored to the station to meet the next train about an hour later. The train came in. I waited for the people to get off, and they got off in droves, but there was no Thomas Wolfe. 
I continued that for the rest of the afternoon and well into the evening, meeting every train with no Tom Wolfe. Finally, as I remember, about one o'clock of a very clear, frosty night, Christmas morning. I met the train. There weren't many people got off it. It was almost ready to pull out when finally Tom came down the steps. He was carrying his overcoat in his arm. In one hand, he carried an overnight bag. In the other hand, he carried what looked like a dead animal. He was holding it by the tail. I went up and shook hands. He was sort of sheep-faced, and he said, Sorry to be late, Ed. I hadn't meant to do this. But he said, I got something here for your boy for Christmas, and he held out the dead animal. It was the largest and ugliest stuffed toy dog anybody had ever seen. It had been gift-wrapped when he bought it, but he had used it to wipe up the bars with. The wrappings had come off, the box had disintegrated, the tail of the dog was almost off, it was hanging by a few threads, and it was very much the worse for wear. Nevertheless, the dog went under the tree that night, and the boy got it for Christmas. On another occasion, Tom visited again with his friends Clayton and Kathleen Hoagland. And another thing about Tom that few people really realized was that he always thought he didn't have enough time. I remember when he'd come out to our place, he was very fond of my mother. She would play the piano and uh, sing. She could play anything he'd want. And he loved the... Uh, Oh, Ginny with the light brown hair and uh, all of those uh, um, Stephen Foster things. He was very romantic about his music. And, um, and I still think that Ginny with the light brown hair is one of the most beautiful of all songs of that type written. But he, my mother, used to sing it, and then Tom would join in. But um, the interesting thing is my mother is very good at telling fortunes with cards. And Tom would always want his fortune told. But he would stand behind her while she was dealing out the cards. And he would just wring his hands with nervousness. Then he would start to prowl up and down the room. If you see death there, Mrs. Jewell, if you see death there, don't tell me. Don't tell me. And then he'd come back. He'd look over at the cards. Is death there? She'd say no. Don't tell me if you see it. That was always on his mind, an early death. He thought that he could never write down all he had to write. Something has spoken to me in the night, burning the tapers of the waning year. Something has spoken in the night and told me I shall die. I know not where, saying, to lose the earth you know for greater knowing, to lose the life you have for greater life, to leave the friends you loved for greater loving, to find a land more kind than home, more large than earth, whereon the pillars of this earth are founded, toward which the conscience of the world is tending. A wind is rising. And the rivers blow. He was, to me, he was a very tragic and sad figure, and a very wonderful figure, because he was eating himself out with this terrific urge to get every bit of America done. And I think if more people would read Thomas Wolfe, the same as what happened to me, they would begin to feel the pulse of this great country. Because that's what he does. His novels are so big, people say they're formless. But they're not. They're like America. And Tom, when he'd speak about writing, which he often did and discuss it, he would... Um, it wouldn't be in a small thing, but it would be in the great outlook of the thing. But he could take... Well, another thing, he could take the smallest piece, a piece of paper like this, you see. That, to him, had the romance of the forest. He would get him. What uh, the men who handled it, uh, 
the store it was bought from, the people who might have handled it before he got it, what would have happened to that piece of paper if someone else had got it? But what was happening to it when he had it? He would tell you the color, how the light was on it, the shadow of his hand on it. That was the greatness of Tom. He could see beauty in everything and make poetry out of everything. Well, there's been a lot of myth and legend about the way Thomas wrote. wrote. And he had two different ways of writing. One belonged to his earlier period and another to his later period. In his earlier period, he used the top of a refrigerator as a desk and stood up at it and had his paper on top of the refrigerator and wrote in that way. I knew him at a later period when he had acquired different habits of writing. I remember particularly the late afternoon of the last day Thomas Wolfe spent in New York. He was planning to take a train at seven-something from Pennsylvania Station to go out to Purdue University to make a speech. And then he was going on to the West Coast, the only part of the country he had never seen. The fact that he'd never seen it was, of course, one reason he wanted to go there. Another reason was that he wanted to ride on a streamlined train and he had never done so. At that time, there were no streamlined trains in the East. Well, on this particular afternoon, his last in New York, I arrived at his apartment in the Chelsea to take possession of the manuscript which he was going to turn over to me, and which he did turn over to me. But when I arrived about five in the afternoon, Tom was still writing. He welcomed me, told me to sit down. He'd be ready in about a minute, but there was something he wanted to finish. I sat down on an old stiff sofa, and the minute lasted for an hour while Tom wrote. There was a big table in the living room of this suite he had, and on that table was a huge stack of yellow second sheets, which he used for his manuscript writing. Beside it was an immense pile of pencils which his secretary sharpened every morning. He sat there writing away in his great big gargantuan scrawl with about six to eight lines on the page. And as he would write and finish a page, he would grab it with his left hand and shove it on the floor, take a new page and go on. When he wore out a pencil, he'd throw it on the floor. And the floor was littered with sheets containing his writing. None of the sheets was numbered. It was his secretary's job to pick the sheets up and by the internal evidence put them in order and then type them out. Well, he sat there, and that was his manner of writing and his manner of working in the latest period of his life. He sat there and poured out, I suppose he must have poured out 5,000 words in that hour. And so, Wolf left for his western journey, stopping at Purdue University, where he gave a brilliant speech, and then proceeded to Seattle. There, he fell desperately ill. The doctors who attended him felt he should go to Johns Hopkins Hospital. And under the care of his sister, Mabel, and a nurse, Thomas Wolfe was brought on a train across the width of the continent he loved so passionately. We got into Baltimore on Saturday morning... And uh, the, the Hopkins people were there. The ambulance was there and an intern or two to take him. And when he was lying on that uh, stretcher in the station, uh, Tom looked up and he said, where are you taking me to now? I said, well, Tom, we're going to try to get you well. You've been having these dreadful headaches. And I said, and I want to tell you one thing, Tom. You're going up there where, there, where all these people can find out what's causing all this. And when you get all right... You're going to cross the country, and you won't be bothered with a single member of your family. I said, we won't be following after you or anything, but we just can't stand to see you sick like this. And he said, I, I want to rest. I'm awfully tired. Well, I left them, and I followed the ambulance in a taxi. I arrived from New York the same morning. Tom had, had arrived about an hour before I got there, so I went straight out to the hospital and was shown into his room. I shall never forget 
that occasion, Tom was lying in the bed. He half lifted himself into a sitting position, resting on his elbows, put out one immense hand and shook mine and said, Ed, it's wonderful to see you, glad to see you. How are you? How are you? I told him I was all right, but how was he? Oh, he said, these terrible headaches. I don't know what causes it. Maybe they'll find out. I said, I hope so. And I sat down beside the bed and we began to talk. I knew what he wanted from me was reassurance about the manuscript which he had left with me and which by then I had read. It was the manuscript from which later three books were edited and published posthumously. I gave him complete reassurance about those books, how wonderful they were, and he began talking to me very lucidly, very clearly, and suddenly he stopped in the middle of a sentence. And it was though, as though a shade had been drawn on a scene you'd been looking at. The shade came down. Everything went blank. He sat there for a moment, not looking around wildly or anything, just blank. The shade then went up. He resumed the sentence in the middle exactly where it was. That was the only evidence I saw of the effect on his mind of what turned out to be the cause of his death which was tuberculosis of the brain. When Tom lay dying in Baltimore, he wrote a letter which I think was perhaps one of the finest anyone has ever written, and it was written to Max, and went as follows. Dear Max, I am sneaking this against orders, but I've got a hunch, and I wanted to write these words to you. I've made a long voyage and been to a strange country, and I've seen the dark man very close, and I don't think I was too much afraid of him. But so much of mortality still clings to me. I wanted most desperately to live, and still do. And I thought about you all a thousand times and wanted to see you all again, and there was the impossible anguish and regret of all the work I had not done, of all the work I had to do. And I know now I'm just a grain of dust. And I feel as if a great window has been opened on life I did not know about before. And if I come through this, I hope to God I am a better man. And in some strange way I can't explain, I know I am a deeper and a wiser one. If I get on my feet and out of here, it will be months before I head back. But if I get on my feet, I'll come back. Whatever happens, I had this hunch, and I wanted to write you and tell you, no matter what happens or has happened... I shall always think of you and feel about you the way it was that 4th of July day three years ago when you met me at the boat and we went out on the cafe on the river and had a drink and later went on top of the tall building and all the strangeness and the glory and the power of life and of the city was below. Yours always, Tom. He died September 15th, 1938, and was taken by his family to Asheville, North Carolina, and buried in Riverside Cemetery. And I think if more people would read Thomas Wolfe, the same as what happened to me, they would begin to feel the pulse of this great country. There, where the hackles of the Rocky Mountains blaze in the blank and naked radiance of the moon, go make your resting stool upon the highest peak. Can you not see us now? The continental wall juts sheer and flat, its huge black shadow on the plain, and the plain sweeps out against the east. 2,000 miles away. The great snake that you see there is the Mississippi River. Behold the gem-strung towns and cities of the good green east, flung like stardust through the field of night. That spreading constellation of the north is called Chicago, and that giant wink that blazes in the moon is the pendant lake that it is built upon. 
There's Boston, ringed with the bracelet of its shining little towns and all the lights that sparkle on the rocky indentations of New England. Here, southward and a little to the west, and yet still coasted to the sea, is our intensest ray, the splintered firmament of the towered island of Manhattan. Turn now, seeker, on your resting stool atop the Rocky Mountains and look another thousand miles or so across the moon-blazing fiend world of the painted desert and beyond Sierra's Ridge. That magic conjuries of light there to the west, ringed like a studded belt around the magic setting of its lovely harbor, is the fabled town of San Francisco. Below it, Los Angeles and all the cities of the California shore. Observe the whole of it. Survey it as you might survey a field. Make it your garden seeker or your backyard patch. Be at ease in it. It's your oyster, yours to open if you will. Don't be frightened. It's not so big now. When your footstool is the Rocky Mountains, reach out and dip a hatful of cold water from Lake Michigan. Drink it. We've tried it. You'll not find it bad. Take your shoes off and work your toes down in the river oozes of the Mississippi bottom. It's very refreshing on a hot night in the summertime. Help yourself to a bunch of Concord grapes up there in northern New York State. They're getting good now. Or raid that watermelon patch down there in Georgia. Or if you like... You can try the rocky fords here at your elbow in Colorado. Just make yourself at home. Refresh yourself. Get the feel of things. Adjust your sights. And get the scale. It's your pasture now. And it's not so big. Only 3,000 miles from east to west. Only 2,000 miles from north to south. But all between. Where 10,000 points of light prick out the cities towns and villages, there, seeker, you will find us burning in the night. Here, as you pass through the brutal sprawl, the 20 miles of rails and rickets of the South Chicago slums, here, in an unpainted shack, is a Negro boy, and seeker... He is burning in the night. Behind him is a memory of the cotton fields, the flat and mournful pineland barrens of the lost and buried south. Farther still behind, the slave driver's whip, the slave ship, and far off, the jungle dirge of Africa. And before him, what? A roped-in ring, a blaze of lights, across from him a white champion, the bell, the opening, and all around the vast sea roaring of the crowd. Then the lightning faint and stroke, the black panther's paw, the hot rotating presses, and the rivers of sheeted print. Oh, seeker, where is the slave ship now? Or there, in the clay-baked Piedmont of the south, that lean and tan-faced boy who sprawls there in the creaking chair among admiring cronies before the open doorways of the fire department and tells them how he pitched the team to shut out victory today. What visions burn? What dreams possess him, seeker of the night? The pack stands of the stadium, the bleachers sweltering with their unshaded hordes, the faultless velvet of the diamond, unlike the clay-baked outfields down in Georgia. The mounting roar of 80,000 voices and Gehrig coming up to bat. The boy himself upon the pitching mound. The lean face steady as a hound's. Then the nod, the signal, and the wind-up. The rawhide arm that snaps and crackles like a whip. The small white bullet of the blazing ball. Its loud report in the oil pocket of the catcher's mitt. The umpire's thumb jerked upward. The clean strike. For there again in the east side ghetto of Manhattan, two blocks away from the East River, a block away from the gas house district and its thuggery. There in the swarming tenement, shut in his sweltering cell, breathing the sun-baked air through open window at the fire escape, cell there away into a little semblance of privacy and solitude from all the brawling and vociferous life and argument of his family and the seething hive around him, 
The boy sits and pours upon his book. In shirt sleeves, bent above his table to meet the hard glare of a naked bulb, he sits with gaunt, starved face converging to his huge beaked nose, the weak eyes squinting painfully through his thick lens glasses, his greasy hair roached back in oily scrolls above the slanting cage of his painful and constricted brow. And for what? For what this agony of concentration? For what this hell of effort? For what this intense withdrawal from the poverty and squalor of dirty brick and rusty fire escapes? From the raucous cries and violence and never-ending noise? For what? Because, brother, he is burning in the night. He sees the class, the lecture room, the shining apparatus of gigantic laboratories, the open field of scholarship and pure research certain knowledge, and the world distinction of an Einstein name. So then, to every man his chance. To every man, regardless of his birth, his shining golden opportunity. To every man the right to live, to work, to be himself, and to become whatever thing his manhood and his vision can combine to make him. This seeker is the promise of America. You have been listening to Biography in Sound, which tonight presented a portrait of Thomas Wolfe. We wish to thank our guests, Mrs. Ralph Harris Wheaton, Professor Theodore Ersom, Mr. John Hall Wheelock, Mr. Edward Aswell, and Mrs. Clayton Hoagland, and our dramatic reader, Ken Nordine. We also wish to express our gratitude to those who gave of their time and knowledge of Thomas Wolfe, to our writer, Earl Hamner, and our director, George Boutsas. Thomas Wolfe, tonight's biography in sound, was first broadcast last November 1st and was repeated this evening because of your many requests and the unusual interest shown in the biography of this great American writer. Your narrator was Gene Hamilton. This has been an NBC Radio Network presentation. The preceding program was transcribed. Stay with Weekday every day. Weekday stays with you.